Welcome everyone. I'm Lorraine DeBono, Managing Partner at FLG Partners, the leading CFO, COO, and board advisory firm in the US. We serve clients globally. Today, we're going to explore a topic relevant to C-suite teams in the consumer sector, that is CFOs building brands. While CFOs aren't traditionally thought of as core to brand building, at FLG we know that, in fact, CFOs are essential leaders when it comes to making the tough decisions necessary to build growth businesses, especially when it comes to CPG and direct-to-consumer brands. More than ever, consumer CEOs and boards need sound advice when they face critical decisions such as how to build brands, how to measure ROI of marketing campaigns, where to invest capital, and whether to transition from brick and mortar to digital e-commerce or pursue an omni-channel distribution strategy. We have four highly experienced consumer-focused FLG partners with us today to help us navigate this topic. Each of them has held senior roles in CPG, retail, e-commerce, and D2C companies, helping these companies refine their business models, implement new business processes and systems, restructure, raise capital, optimize mm -hmm. performance, and lead M&A. Generally, you name it. First, Stephanie Roberts joined FLG in 2017 and has 20 years of C-suite experience in both public and private companies. Her career has spanned both CPG and digital first consumer brands. As a C-level executive, Stephanie has helped lead the finance functions at Rothy's, Third Love, and she is currently interim CFO at Goop. Prior to FLG, Stephanie was the CFO of Specialized Bicycle Components, and earlier in her career, she was CFO at Old Navy, the largest division at Gap, where she helped turn around the business with a strong focus on inventory management, retail pricing, and the remodel of their fleet of stores. Second with us today, Jennifer Cho, who joined FLG in 2020 with over 30 years of financial and operating experience in both public and private companies. She is based in SoCal, and her leadership spans entertainment, digital media, technology, consumer products, and corporate and investment banking. Before joining us, Jennifer was EVP and CFO of Otter Media, a digital media company that was acquired by AT&T in 2018. She has helped C-suite roles, she has held, excuse me, C-suite roles at AT&T's Entertainment Group, Gap Brand, and she was corporate treasurer of DirecTV and Gap. The third partner on our panel, Mark Archer, joined FLG in 2021 and has spent over 30 years as both a CFO and president in both public and private venture capital and private equity bag companies. With an emphasis on consumer-facing companies, such as Jamba Juice, Del Taco, and other global special retailers and hospitality companies. His deep C-suite experience includes working with manufacturing, distribution, gaming, automotive companies, as well as tech businesses, and including M&A and IPO experience. Our fourth partner on the panel is Monica Stevenson. She joined us in 2020 with over 20 years of finance and operations experience and over a decade of specialized expertise in consumer and luxury goods, apparel, beauty, and retail. She's based in New York and has broad executive management experience working for global brands such as Versace, Yves Saint Laurent, and Dolce and & Gabbana. <laughs> Prior to FLG, Monica was CFO of Torneo, and she was also CFO and operate, Chief Operating Officer at MCM Worldwide. So welcome to our panel of four great CPG CFOs, and let's get started. Our first topic today addresses the heart of brand building, that is growth, and how CFOs add value at companies to manage growth successfully. We're gonna start with Stephanie. As all CFOs know, one of the essential tools for managing growth is having a long range plan. Tell us how and when is the best time, Stephanie, to build a long range plan for growth? Thank you, Lorene. First of all, I'm super excited to be here with um, some very good friends of mine and, and peer partners at FLG. So uh, first, every company should start with a long range strategy. Uh, this strategy sets the strategic goals for the company on what you're going to do but most importantly, what you're not going to do. And then a financial plan is built after you land your strategy, which should always include, and you'll hear this from me, 
a low and a high scenario. And this is really critical for cash flow forecasting, which we'll talk about a bit later. Uh, the time horizon for a long range strategy depends on the company. Mm -hmm. So I find for CPG companies, two years. Two years is good. Now, if it's a company that's more complex and has large capital investments, whether it's building distribution centers or factories or a big uh, research and development budget, then that warrants a longer time horizon. So maybe five to eight years. Um, but getting back to CPG, I'm not in favor of a long range plan that stretches out more than three. And I'll tell you why. I find that the world is moving so fast that the outer years generally are just, in, uh, it's just math on years four and five. Um, in fact, it was a few, I don't know, last week I watched a 60 minutes episode on the Australian company Afterpay. And they said they had built a five-year plan and they basically executed the five years in, in, the, in two years. It went that fast. So uh, in terms of how frequently I update the long-range plan, about every year, year and a half, you know, just depending. Uh, it's important to just be on the pulse of the business, but then also to zoom out and think of the bigger trends like supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. Um, and then lastly, uh, reviewing performance across different time horizons is critical for both the current investors, future investors, and then your, your banks. So uh, that, that is- that, that was a very helpful <laughs> framework, um, Stephanie. So thank you on kind of how a company helps to set a company up for growth, creating the plan and then executing and building on it. So now let's turn to financing growth. Mark, I know you've helped multiple brands raise the capital they need to invest in new real estate, systems, acquisitions, all of that good stuff. How do you decide when to raise capital, how much, and how to determine the right mix of debt and equity? Yeah. Well, first, when raising capital, it's critical you understand your cash requirements. Mm -hmm. One of the key responsibilities of the chief financial officer is to ensure the company has sufficient liquidity to cover their cash operating needs of the business, which would include working capital and the day-to-day -day ebbs and flows of working capital, capital expenditures, and operating losses, if applicable. It's essential the CFO maintain a forward cash forecast, looking at a sufficient period of time to allow for additional fundraising if required. As any CFO who has experienced a cash squeeze will tell you, the worst time to do fundraising is when cash is tight. In general, you'll wanna maintain sufficient liquidity to support the business for at least 12 months. This will be one of the tests applied by your public accounting firm to ensure they can opine the company is a going concern. Now let's talk about how to raise cash and when. Whether to raise cash through the issuance of debt or the sale of equity will depend on where the business is in its corporate life cycle, the current amount of leverage in the business and the market's appetite for the issuance of equity. Typically, early stage companies raise cash through private placements of equity either through angel investors or through venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. As the company gets larger and seeks a higher business valuation, angel investors will drop out and venture capitalists will pick up all funding requirements. A VC will typically require a seat on the board as part of their investment and a preferential return on their investment when the company is sold or goes public. Now, as the company matures, it may become possible to raise cash through the placement of debt. Typical commercial debt instruments come in two forms, loans based off the cash flow generated by the business and loans based on the value of certain assets in the business. Mm -hmm. Both types of loans are used in retail companies and are typically structured where part of the loan is fixed and the balance is structured as a line of credit. That was a great summary, Mark. Thank you on the importance of cash in a CPG business and how to access capital. Another challenge for growth businesses, as all of us know, is when to shift focus from top line revenue growth to optimizing performance and bottom line profitability. So Jennifer, I know you have a lot of experience here. 
Walk us through your perspective on this. How do you see growth businesses successfully making that transition? Sure, I'd be happy to, Lauren. First, I'd like to say good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, while it's important to focus on top line growth, the CFO also needs to ensure the revenue growth is sustainable and expenses are well managed. I've seen management push revenue growth at all costs to drive a higher valuation with no viable path to profitability. <laughs> to me, this is, this is unacceptable. Startups and early stage companies are likely to operate at loss in the beginning, but CFOs most focus on improving gross margin dollars so that you can cover all your expenses. Mm -hmm. to, do, to, to do this well, um, and you can actually shift to bottom line profitability. To cover these various investments to drive revenue growth, companies must start with strong gross margins, which will fully cover the operating expenses, which will contribute to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. When I was at Gap, we were obsessed with achieving healthy margins by not discounting too much or running too many promos that would hurt the top line and gross margins. As you know, it all starts with having the right merchandise, which will result in a higher sell-through at full price. In addition, I had to make sure the pricing and promotional strategies were working to optimize margins. And sometimes we were successful at this and sometimes we faltered. Mm -hmm. One example I like to share was a Black Friday promotion that we ran when I was at Gap. As you know, this will be the biggest shopping day in retail. And there was this urgency to drive traffic and conversion. We promoted 50% off the entire store while online we offer 40% off. Basically, we were rewarding those who visited our physical stores additional 10% off, but this was offset by conversion, higher conversion rates in the stores. The margins took a hit in the stores, but we were successful in pushing gift card sales and impromptu purchases. As you know, when you're in the store, you just start grabbing things. <laughs> um, one problem with running these big seasonal promotions is that you have to repeat them to get your customers to come back. And this could ultimately hurt your long-term health of the brand. Well, if you think running a retail apparel business is challenging, try, try running managing a digital media company where your primary cost of goods sold is content costs and revenue is generated from monetization of that content. This model is extremely risky. If the content is not well received, it will not drive the revenue and it would have a huge impact to your gross margin negative impact that is. Many times you'll see declining gross margin while the operating expenses are fixed and resulting in much bigger losses. CFOs you know, get off, we, we often get lectured to those who are seeking funding that you have to spend money to make money. I know I've heard this many, many times, but we have to also remind these folks that at some point the business needs to optimize its performance and deliver profitability as Companies are not in the business of blowing through cash and never seeing a return on that investment. C completely agree with you, um, Jennifer. And that was a really excellent perspective on how you move a company towards profitability, even though sometimes your um, board members or your investors may say spend, spend, spend. But at any rate, um, now let's wrap up the topic of managing growth with an issue a lot of consumer CFOs must grapple with when it comes to growth. And that is when and how to increase product prices to protect company margins. Monica, uh, bringing you into the conversation, what's your perspective on this? Good morning, Lorraine, and thanks for that very important question. You know, this pandemic has caused many problems, and among them is that we are seeing inflation across many product categories. You know, stock shortages and increased shipping costs have led many brands to take protective measures on gross margin and increase their prices accordingly. Now, there's never a hard or fast rule on when or even how to increase your prices, and no brand does this lightly, nor should they. What is key is three things. Know your product, know your customers, and know your competition. CFOs should work with their sales and product margin teams to ensure proper evaluation, among other things, of how the market's performing, what are your competitors doing, which of your products are performing well and which are performing not so well, and any price sensitivities the market can and simply cannot bear. 
These factors typically coupled with the CFO's own attention to the company's gross margin targets and external factors around inflation that one should be following should be the leading indicators of when there's not only an opportunity for one to take a price increase, but a true necessity. Those are great insights, Monica. Let's turn to our second topic today now for the audience, which is making better investments to build brands more successfully, the how, the what, and the when. So Mark, we're gonna start with you um, and let's look at investments in marketing. So how do you measure the ROI mark of marketing investments in an age of MarTech, digital marketing, social media, and all these new things? Yeah. Uh, marketing ROI is the amount of revenue and margin dollars generated by specific marketing activities compared to the cost associated with the advertising employed. ROI is often expressed as a percentage and calculating ROI allows you to determine how effective your marketing activities are both across the company and with respect to specific channels and campaigns. In retail companies, much of the discretionary spending in the business is allocated to customer acquisition. So it's especially important for the CFO to keep their eye on the results being generated by the investment in advertising being made. Because a company's marketing spend is typically ongoing, assigning revenue and margin to specific activities can be challenging. Mm -hmm. And reaching down below the total company level to attribute results to specific channels is rarely straightforward. But attempting to do this is very important so you can fine tune your media spend to make sure that you're directing funds to the channels that produce the highest ROI and business results. I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more, Mark, that using ROI measurements to determine effectiveness of marketing strategies is so important. So hopefully, audience, you take note of that as well. Another equally important area of investment, especially now with this extremely critical labor shortage we're experiencing, is making the right investments in people. So Monica, in such a competitive market, how do you believe CFOs can help management teams make the right calls when it comes to investment in talent? Yeah, indeed, Lorraine, candidates today have no shortage of opportunities to choose from, and companies are having to pay significantly above previous comp rates to secure great talent, and sometimes even not so great talent, to be truthful. My advice is to always be focused on talent. Um, it's better to not focus on recruitment when you have an open position and to also not solely leave this just to your HR teams, mm -hmm. but to really integrate it into your own role as a CFO. A critical aspect of securing talent in a tight and competitive market, in my opinion, is you need to build your own network and then you need to tap into it when need arises. Also, CFOs have to work very closely with chief people officers and heads of HR to ensure that you have solid personnel budgets in place. For those of us in larger companies, um, typically you want to make sure that you can stay competitive by creating budgets that have a salary band with a high and a low position for each, high and a low range for each position. This is gonna really allow the HR managers and the hiring managers to adjust to the competitive market without having to bug you as the CFO for each hire they make above budget. <laughs> and last but not least, do not forget to focus on things aside from base compensation. Really focus in on your rounded out plans, such as you know, option plans and bonus plans, because there's always a whole array of things that employees truly value in today's time. Could not agree with you more. Great advice, Monica, to our audience. Uh, Stephanie, I know you have a perspective on this in terms of CFOs managing investments in talent. So tell us your thoughts. Yeah, uh, thank you, Monica. Um, hard to follow that answer, but listen, I've had a great deal of success retaining top talent during my career, and I'm really proud of that. My advice to all leaders is understand what's really important to the people you manage. I mean, that's, 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 that's probably the golden rule. You know, for some it's recognition, uh, for others it's skill development, and, and then yet for others, they want exposure to the, the leadership team. So 
employees will naturally focus on pay, 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 um, if you don't spend time talking about what's really important to them. You know, I can't agree with you more, Stephanie, because what I have found is once you as a leader can figure out what is most important to your team members, not only do you um, engender loyalty from them, but much better performance and attitude. So could not agree with you more. Another area CFOs often get leveraged in is balancing operational investments across an enterprise and then negotiating how much capital should go to which departments in the budgeting process. So Jennifer, how do you as a CFO handle this in practice? Meaning how do you prioritize these investments of scarce capital and handle internally the tough negotiations with your colleagues? Sure. Well, since there's always a limited amount of cash available to be deployed at a company, being able to prioritize these investments, as discussed by Mark and Monica earlier, is critical. To do this well, a CFO needs to develop a strong partnership with their peers, especially with the CMO on all that marketing spend, CTO on all the tech spend, and chief people officer, as Monica noted earlier. As a CFO, you don't want to be surprised by the C CEO alerting to a major project or funding request coming from one of your peers at the very last minute. You should be invited to these discussions early in the process and be able to debate, ask questions, and assess the ROI. These investments generally fall into two buckets. They're either a revenue driver or projects aimed at cost savings. As revenue generating projects tend to get more support in general, the CFO must try to achieve a good balance between the two. Most major projects should have been already discussed or identified in the LRP process that Stephanie talked about earlier, or they should be pretty much identified and included in the annual budgeting process. But you all know there's always, always unanticipated and unbudgeted items. The CFO must be prepared to quickly evaluate and adjust capital allocation as needed in these cases. I think being transparent and open to listening willing to brainstorm and collaborate will lead to a successful partnership with your peers. Even when you disagree and decline to fund the project, you can respect each other's point of view and maintain a healthy relationship. Those were um, really uh, good insights, Jennifer, thank you. Now shifting to our third topic today, which is crisis management, which is finding opportunities and silver linings. And this topic um, is so relevant to where most consumer businesses find themselves today, exiting a pandemic, but still challenged on so many fronts, be it labor shortages, supply chain issues, you name it. So I'd like to turn to Mark and Stephanie for their thoughts here. First, Mark, much has been made recently in terms of the decline in retail stocks and the future of retail in general. What do you see as the role brick and mortar stores will play in retail businesses moving forward? And how do you think CFOs can optimize physical store performance? Yeah, well, I, I'm a believer that in-store shopping is here to stay. <laughs> um, over the last 18 months, uh, the pandemic has obviously brought many changes to the retail industry, most notably the dramatic increase in online sales and both the temporary and permanent closure of thousands of stores. But with life now beginning to enter a post-pandemic phase, recent surveys indicate that many consumers are anxious to have their in-store options available to them again. I think what's driving this is the critical role that brick and mortar stores play in enhancing the consumer shopping experience in delivering value, both product touch and feel and the personal trusted salesperson advice that helps consumers make informed decisions. Now, obviously e-commerce can't physically engage with customers. Brick and mortar stores also complement the continued shift to omni-channel commerce. Savvy retailers have expanded beyond just a retail store base and into e-commerce which now accounts for approximately 25% of retail sales. But for at least over a decade, consumers have been pushing retailers toward an omni-channel model of fulfillment. Customers want it when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. And the brick and mortar store is critical to that omni-channel model, 
supporting click and collect, buy online, return in the store, as well as minimizing shipping time and shipping costs by allowing fulfillment of online orders from local stores. Uh, thanks, Mark, for that. Stephanie, what are your thoughts on the in-store shopping experience and what do you think about its future? Yeah, so I think Mark covered the key elements. Listen, I strongly believe that people like to engage with other people and being home with COVID is so isolating. Um, so I think that brands will have more events in physical spaces, um, especially to reward loyal customers mm -hmm. with like early access events, fashion shows, et cetera. Um, we did this at Rothy's, we were doing it at Goop, um, Third Love, uh, Third Love will have retail stores in the future and I'm sure they'll, they'll follow the same, so. Okay, Stephanie, and make sure I get an invitation. <laughs> Got it. Um, uh, both of you guys, great insights about the role brick and mortar stores will play in our future. Now, let me turn to Jennifer. Um, I know COVID-19 impacts have led to the restructuring of an if not full on pivots for many consumer based businesses. So what, it, what are you seeing, Jennifer, um, in terms of consumer business models adjusting and transitioning to the changes in consumer behavior resulting from the pandemic? Sure. I will speak to two real examples of the companies I recently advised and led during COVID. This first one was in real estate brokerage business and the company took immediate actions when the US economy basically shut down in what, March of last year. Um, not knowing how long the pandemic would persist, the CFO I was advising focus on reducing variable costs immediately. People cost being one of the largest components of operating expenses we froze new hires and implemented salary cuts throughout the organization to, uh, to avoid doing a major reduction in force. Being shut down and work from home did provide some upsides as there were no travel and entertainment costs and employee related costs were minimal. Mm -hmm. In the area of fixed costs, we also renegotiated corporate and marketing office leases where feasible. These actions allowed the company to save a significant amount in lease payments. When the real estate activities bounced back strong in Q3 of last year, we were able to start hiring again, but fortunately some of the savings that we had in place during the shutdown continued on, improving overall operating efficiencies. This company also completed its IPO earlier this year mm -hmm. and the entire roadshow was done virtually, which was very efficient. Given how much we achieved without having to travel during the pandemic, we may see less need for business travel going forward. Second example I have is in the retail apparel space where this company operated both physical and online stores. Obviously when everything was shut down, the company had to quickly adjust their operating model to manage inventory and store payroll while reassessing their overall real estate portfolio. Like many retailers, we had to furlough some store employees until we could eventually bring them back, um, manage inventory tightly, canceling or pushing out purchase orders where possible, and optimizing online sales were the critical actions taken during this period. It is remarkable how quickly this business recovered from its pre-pandemic levels as there was a huge pent up consumer demand, but the business model for this client has permanently shifted to a greater allocation to e-commerce versus stores. And I'm sure this is true for many other retailers out there. The last point I will make, Lorraine, is that COVID taught us a lot, lot of things that we didn't know before. I'm sure most of us believe there's no way, no way we could all work remotely for over a year and a half and run the business um, in your PJs. Well, maybe not PJ bottoms, but it may not be ideal, but we proved that we could. We now have to figure out the best hybrid work model that can deliver cost efficiency, optimal productivity, and still care for our employee satisfaction. Absolutely. And I know that a lot of companies are working on that right now as uh, expectations are that a lot of employees will be going back to work starting in January on a hybrid model. Um, now turning to Monica, I'd like to zero in on another key challenge many CFOs are facing right now, which is supply chain disruptions and big ones, shipping delays, increased shipping costs, you name it. We're seeing this everywhere. 
So in your experience, Monica, how can a CFO get ahead of supply chain chaos and create solutions which serve to protect the company's performance? Yeah, Lorraine, I hate to inject a bit of humor here, but we are all in the same boat on this one. Oh, yeah. Um, no one could have ever, ever, ever predicted the current supply chain challenges we find ourselves living in today. For example, I, I went from giving updates to my CEO on supply chain and shipping nearly never <laughs> to doing that now, weekly and sometimes even daily, depending on the delivery. The pandemic has really led to shutdowns followed by sharp growth and consumer demand a year later. And among other things, we are continuing to see the raw material and labor shortages, shipping container shortages, stock outages, order cancellations, factory and port closures, and now even it seems like products is falling off of boats because they can't get to shore soon enough. I mean, we could have never, ever predicted this. Us CFOs are all struggling to keep up with the rolling set of challenges over the past year. And worse, most analysts are predicting that this is going to continue well into 2022. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, these are conditions. I mean, these conditions really, really, really has resulted in margin losses as companies struggle to just really get their goods on shore. And we have to face it. There's not much that any brand can do to control the cost of shipping itself. So what can we do as a CFO? You know, I would say that the first thing that a CFO should do is really ensure we work with our teams to have a good focus around optimizing our flow of goods. Mm -hmm. And then the second critical thing that we must do is ensure consistent transparency about the dollar and cents impacts of these challenges to everyone involved. Mm -hmm. More than ever, we have to stay close to our supply chain and everyone that's leading it. And we have to do real time demand planning. It is critical, critical, critical. Since, since order to cash cycles are typically taking two to three times longer on average, if you're lucky, understanding firsthand your order to cash cycle and inventory to cash cycles mm -hmm. and what that means is critical to optimizing cash and inventory. I joked earlier, but one tool I've had to implement is a weekly supply chain update, which tracks our productions in-house, in transit, in DC, and what's on order, and now what's sitting on a boat and a port. Mm -hmm. um, this will really help you manage what you're planning teams to ensure that you do not over or under invest in your inventory at this time. And then, you know, you can never get away from the budgeting and long range planning that both Stephanie and Jennifer talked about. Mm -hmm. And it's critical at this point in time that you do run those best and worst case ana analysis around your sales and your margin and your inventory and your cash, because all of these things are being impacted. And then transparency is key, keeping your CEO, your board and your investors informed of the margin impacts caused by these macro conditions should be your top, top priority. So it sounds as though, Monica, you know, keeping your board and CEO informed all the time of what's going on is, is the most important. Um, and, I, and I completely agree. So thank you for those insights and um, great insights for the audience. Stephanie, I'd like to turn to you for a moment as I know that um, you have a particular expertise in cash management, cash being king all the time. So having sufficient cash on hand to fund operations and forecasting cash requirements correctly is so critical, but especially in the midst of a crisis like what we've just gone through and are still in. So tell us and how you help to ensure that your clients manage cash risks appropriately. Yeah. Well, first of all, first of all, forecasting cash keeps you out of trouble. So I'll just start with that lead in. What's interesting is early in my career, I actually worked for cash rich companies. So we were more figuring out what to do with the cash. So, you know, it's really as I moved into consulting the last four years, uh, then I've built that skill. So it's one of the four areas I get my arms around very quickly with a new client. Smart. Listen, the big drivers are, I'd say there's four, uh, solid, solid forecast from sales to EBITDA mm -hmm. with a high and low scenario, 
an open to buy inventory receipt forecast, you know, how much inventory is on order, a robust payroll forecast. And then lastly, you know, CPG companies don't have a lot of capital, but if you work for a company that had a lot of capital, then that would be the fourth component. If you forecast cash well, only then can you set financial targets for both inventory mm -hmm. and hiring. If you, if you don't forecast cash well, then you could end up approving more inventory than you should have or more headcount. And there's a huge downside to doing that. Um, the most painful is layoffs if you overhire and then markdowns if you overbuy. So if you have a solid, um, yo, sorry, you have to have a solid payroll forecast and a solid open to buy uh, inventory forecast. The other kind of my hack that I've always done is I never buy 100% to my inventory plan. I leave some open to chase. It's a bit more difficult now with the supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, being overbought now isn't such a bad thing. So as I said earlier, a robust cash flow forecast keeps you out of trouble. Absolutely right on. That was a great summary. Um, Stephanie, so thank you. So now let's wrap up with our fourth topic, which is around CFO's uh, CFO leadership best practices. So I'd like to turn to you, Mark. As a CFO and president of several companies, you've had to build strong relationships with multiple management teams. So what do you believe is the secret sauce here? What advice would you give to other CFOs in the audience about how best to build and manage C-suite relationships and partnerships? Yeah. So first, focus on collaboration. Mm -hmm. The role of the CFO, which by the nature of the job serves as the right-hand person to the CEO, has evolved over the years from the old focus on financial reporting, risk management, and asset control to now an expanded role with strategic, commercial, and operational elements. The CFO is in a unique position to see the business and all of its very various pieces holistically. He or she must be a collaborator to influence across the organization to drive performance. Second, I think it's important to be a strong business partner. Successful CFOs serve as effective business partners with all of their functional colleagues. With their direct link to the CEO, CFOs can support their colleagues by providing validation of the data used to support critical business decisions, and they can help their functional colleagues drive change throughout the organization. And then lastly, build trust. Mm -hmm. You know, to accomplish all these things, the CFO must establish trust with their functional colleagues. Absolutely. For me, at the most basic level, the finance team is a support organization there to serve the board, the CEO, and the other leaders in the company. To build trust with the functional leaders, the finance organization needs to establish a successful track record of supporting and adding value to their colleagues whenever the opportunity arises and certainly when they're asked for help. I could, I also agree with that wholeheartedly. I think establishing trust with all of one's colleagues, but especially the CEO is critical. But I know CE, CFOs also need strong board relationships, especially with audit chairs, comp committee chairs and governance chairs. So Stephanie, how do you go about building strong board partnerships? Yeah. So first, there's never there's never a downside to there's never a downside to having a strong relationship with the board. Mm -hmm. However, there's a huge downside if you don't. Okay. So uh, when you build um, strong relationships with board members and chairs, they they get to know kind of your thought process and how disciplined you are and how you think. And a board of directors is there to guide you. And, and we have to remember that. Uh, if you have a strong relationship, it's an indication that you're using the board for okay. guidance, okay? Um, and then the CFO, I, I wanna be careful here, but the CFO has a responsibility to always tell the board the truth mm -hmm. and to frame up risk and opportunity. 
the CEO has the same responsibility, um, but I think the CEO tends to have a, a, a more of a growth mindset, although I'm working Absolutely. on it. Um, but it's important that the CFO comes with that more balanced perspective, Absolutely. okay? Um, and if you have board meetings, let's say uh, once a quarter, I try to touch base with board members between the two meetings and maybe not every board member, um, but you know, I select a few uh, throughout the year. Um, and then just let your CEO know what you talked about with the board. And then lastly, if there's ever a hot topic right before a board meeting, you know, ensure the CEO calls the board members and gives them a heads up. You don't want surprises. I, I could not agree with you more. And actually as an audit committee chair and as a lead independent director of a public company, I appreciate when my CFO or the CEO calls for guidance or just wants to talk through an issue with me. Um, I appreciate the use of my expertise and um, absolutely no surprises. So that's important. Um, turning to you, Monica, another area so critical to effective leadership in all consumer companies is succession planning, building that bench for the future. So tell us a little bit about how you work toward that goal as a CFO. Yeah, this is quite relevant. And I think Stephanie really started to lead into this earlier. You know, talent management often falls by the wayside against all of the other significant things that we're faced as a CFO with day to day. But it is true that there are so, so many benefits to succession planning, as Stephanie was starting to talk about earlier. You know, the first really goes back to that recruitment challenge we discussed. When you develop your own existing team and you start to build that bench from within, it really does help to short circuit the recruitment process and any workplace gaps down the road. Um, second, you know, developing strong emerging leaders helps you as a CFO. It helps you to expand your own role and to be that strategic leader to the business that the CEOs and the boards are expecting. And then last, you, know, you really get a lot of high marks from CEOs, boards, and investors when you do have that succession plan in place, mm -hmm. it draws confidence in them around the stability of the finance organization, knowing that you have put in place those strong number twos ready to take the baton. And then I have to say that personally, I quite enjoy succession planning and, and leaving, developing a team and helping them achieve their own career ambitions into my own job. And some of the tips that I would really share with others is, you know, Again, Stephanie said this best, but focus in on what your team wants. What are their own professional goals and help develop them towards that. Determine this very early on and really make it part of your job. Use the company's performance review process as a vehicle, not only for giving goals to your team, but having them really think about their own goals and to tell you how you can support them in achieving those goals. And then, you know, you really want to, for succession planning purposes, identify your senior leaders with the potential for the C-suite really early on and start grooming them by making them visible to the rest of the C-suite, to the CEO, and to the board. And if you have the benefit of your organization being large enough, try to rotate your people into new roles to expand their knowledge base. I really, really believe that if you truly make succession planning and also talent development focus, it will pay off down the road in, in spades. Those were, that was a great, great insights, Monica. Thank you. Our last question around leadership practices goes to Jennifer. Uh, I know that mentoring is an important skill for all members of the C-suite, as well as ensuring diversity and inclusion amongst company talent pools. So tell us in your experience, Jennifer, what types of strategies have you found to be most successful when it comes to reaching these important objectives? Yes, Lorraine, thanks for raising a topic that I feel so passionate about. I'm a huge believer of investing in people and developing talent. As Monica discussed earlier about labor shortages and competitiveness of the job market today, we must retain and develop our future leaders. It is the responsibility of the senior management to offer mentorship and set the tone at the top that we fully embrace diversity inclusion in all aspects. We need to remove our own personal biases, whether it's conscious or unconscious, in hiring and promoting our people. As a CFO, people look up to you. 
Mm -hmm. And you're in a position to shape and influence others. I've sponsored and participated in, I don't know how many number of mentoring programs earlier in my career. And actually, I'm not a fan of a formal sponsor programs as you're randomly assigned to a mentee. Mm -hmm. And this can feel somewhat awkward and forced. I learned what worked for me was to find my own mentors. My best mentors were the ones I had uh, was the ones that I personally sought out because I admired and respected their leadership qualities. So I encourage employees to seek out their own mentors when they can. In addition to mentoring, I host a small group luncheons, about 10 people or so on a monthly or quarterly basis with employees from all different departments and all levels to cover topics of their interest, not mine, their interests. And my favorite, I would say, is the coffee with the CFO, where a brave employee will sign up for a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> session with me for their own personal development. I try my best to um, practice diversity inclusion when we're selecting these participants to participate in these programs. And I try my best not to scare them off um, and be open and listening. And to be honest, these mentoring sessions are the favorite part of my job. And I've maintained some of these relationships over the years. It's rewarding to see the success of my mentees' careers, knowing that I may have played a small role in it. Mentoring and coaching of a team is what every CFO should do. I don't think it's an option, it's a must. Uh, great insights, Jennifer, and I completely agree with you, and I think our panelists do as well. So we're at a point where um, uh, I hope the audience has enjoyed our conversation. We've covered four great topics. And why don't we take a moment, because I think we have a few minutes left, to go to the chat room to see if we have questions from our audience. So I'm going to open up the chat room, and let's see. Okay, so right now I don't see any questions, but we have a couple of questions that we've set up, so to speak, for our um, panelists. So the first one is going to be to Monica. Um, Monica, maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about how you navigate um, audits with consumer products companies. I know you've done a lot of that in your career. Sure. Well, Lorraine, if it's if it's not a first time audit, I would say to when you step into the company for the first time, you want to truly understand um, how the previous audits went. Um, what were some of the um, standout points, so to speak, from that audit? Um, speak to your audit partner to understand what were the areas of exposure and our risk um, they felt the company had or simply opportunities for improvement and efficiencies around the accounting processes. Um, really learn that very early on, um, as soon as you join an organization. Um, if it is a first time audit, my, my perspective on that, having been um, in private companies and, and mid-market companies, and then also in, in large public companies, is if you go into any organization always thinking with a public mindset, public company mindset, um, it can never fail you in the end. So with that, what I mean is I start thinking about the company's first audit very early. Even if it's not going to be within that year, it may be a few years down the road, you really want to start thinking about it. You want to start thinking about where your finance and accounting team is today, um, where your closing process is today, and what are the things that you need to shore up in both your team and in those processes. Um, and then a, a big thing for me is focus in on your balance sheet because no one else in the business is really doing it outside of the finance team. Everyone's really focused on earnings. Everyone's focused on sales and margin. And they're really just assuming that the accounting and finance team has the balance sheet covered. So you really wanna make sure that you do and that there are no surprises on that balance sheet, that everything is substantiated, supported, cleaned up, um, and you know, if, if you if you're if again, if it's a first year audit, you may want to do a lot of that cleanup before the year of your audit, just so that you can go into your first year audit with a healthy balance sheet. Terrific, thanks, Monica. We do have now some questions from the audience, and I think this one might be a good one for Jennifer to answer. So the question from Kim Clary is: Is there a specific framework or curriculum the panelists suggest for mentoring mentor mentee relationships? 
or is simply an organic relationship with regular check-ins okay? Jennifer, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, the framework, I think there are various frameworks you can use. I think the one that works well, well, work for, well for me is I tend to do uh, my check-ins over coffee or lunch. It just seems a little bit less stuffy and it, the frequency may be quarterly, I think is a good cadence for us. And it just gives you the opportunity to sit down and go through the topics that your mentee wants to really cover. And then 90 days is a good time frame to check in on the progress that we discussed. And another framework that I, I as part of the framework, I would note is it's best not to have your boss be your mentee uh, to be Absolutely. your mentor mm -hmm. because it's, it, that relationship is really different. Your mentor-mentee relationship is different than your, your supervisor and yourself because you still need to um, be delivering and performing and challenges you may have. Some of that may be related to your, 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 your manager, right? And you can't talk about that with, with your manager. So I encourage um, you to look outside of your, your immediate reporting line and quarterly touch in. And, and Stephanie, if others have other comments to add to that, um, you guys jump in. I would like to just add uh, to, to that. I have 40 people that I mentor. Wow. And what, what, what is that? That is a lifelong relationship I've had with people where they, they have an ongoing relationship. They probably work for me. And when they want to talk to me, I always say, frame up what, what it is we want to talk about so I can think about it in advance. And there's generally pivots they're making in their career. And they're like, like how should I think about that? Or they're struggling with maybe uh, the boss they're reporting to. So sometimes mentor mentee is like current company, right? But for me, it's a lifelong thing uh, that uh, I'm honored when they reach out to me. They're like, oh, sorry, I don't wanna bug you. And I'm like, no, I love this because it's, it's difficult for people in their 20s, 30s, 40s to navigate their career. Totally. So mm -hmm. uh, that's just one thing I, th I thought about as the question came through. Those are great, great points. Another one that's related, um, uh, someone has asked here, I believe um, the name is Carol Sweeney, any best practices in hiring in this competitive environment that you can recommend. Any one of you would like to tackle that question quickly? I'll, I'll so jump I, in. I'll, you take it, Mark. Well, I was just basically going to reemphasize what you said, which is, um, you know, don't start looking for somebody when the incumbent has left. It, it's an ongoing process. Um, network, build relationships with recruiters. You know, if you're lucky enough to work in a company where the leadership team would support perhaps bringing a very high, ta high talented, high potential person in, even though there's not necessarily a job opening, a specific opening, take advantage of that. Al always, you know, build the pipeline, be ahead of the curve. Um, you don't want to be behind the curve. And especially given the crazy market environment right now. Monica, did you want to add something there? Yeah, well, I was going to echo what Mark said, and then I was also going to say, you know, this environment, just be prepared to mm -hmm. pay a bit above um, what feels comfortable. And so do a bit of research just to kind of see what the current trends are, um, both in your own, um, your own kind of region, but also just across the nation because people are working remote. And so a lot of people are carrying salaries from higher, higher price regions with them. Um, and then the other thing is tap, you know, as I said earlier, and Mark just reiterated, tap into your own network, but also tap into the rest of your organization network. So um, consider to get creative, you may want to offer some type of incentive for referrals from internal staff if they help to find a, a candidate that gets placed into your organization. I think we have time for one or two more questions. The, the next question, I'm probably going to misstate the name is Divya Os hospital. And the question is, in hyper growth companies, sometimes management gets excited and starts focusing on multiple goals that aren't achievable in a short time. Boy, do we understand that. How does a finance partner help guide management 
to better focus on a few clear goals without being the wet blanket? Who wants to, who wants to take that one? I'll, I'll start. Uh, this is, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Divya is one of the, thank you Divya for being here. Uh, she, uh, she worked for me, she's one of my rising stars, worked for me at Rothy's. And um, that th this question is the one I struggle with because a growth mindset means that you're looking for opportunities to grow. Um, but a lot of times CEOs, they chase shiny pennies. And so whatever you're gonna do, have it be a big enough opportunity. Like don't waste your time with small opportunities. And if you're gonna do it, you wanna make sure you'll do it well. So um, when you spread yourself too thin, what you end up doing is, is, being, is delivering an average job on execution. So uh, I think that number one, you're diluting your resources if you go too wide. Uh, it, it requires a lot of SGNA to support it. And I've seen this in several of the companies that I've managed, uh, and, but you just want to uh, be able to execute really, really well. And if you're spread thin, you just can't. Okay, great. Um, I think we have two more questions and we might be able to make it from Carol, Carolyn Sweeney. Have any of you incorporated cryptocurrency or those types of investments in your organization? I see a lot of shaking heads. Um, uh, Jennifer, are you, you're not shaking your head. <laughs> no, it's interesting because I think this topic is coming up more and more. Um, crypto is becoming, it's not going away. It, it is becoming um, an investment tool that I think we do have to look at. I'm not saying, I'm not endorsing this is what companies would, would actually include in their investment policy. But at this point, I think it requires all of us to be more educated on this topic. The board is asking um, to include this as a board topic. Um, one of the companies that I've been working with, this topic came up. So as, as CFO and finance folks in this room, I would, I would definitely don't just shy away from it. Do some homework. I've been reading up a ton about it. I still don't really get it, but just be prepared. Well, neither and, do I. <laughs> yeah, and I think the key is be prepared, educated, at least be able to talk about it, intelligently discuss it. And then you guys can decide whether it's right or wrong for your company. But I wouldn't you know, dismiss it or don't, don't be scared by it. So that's my advice. Anyone else before we go to the last question? Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question, and this is directed to Stephanie from a Richard Hemington. And the question is, how should a company best manage the coming down from a peak in our business and the business's bicycles, especially relating to stock and AR, when quickly there will be too much inventory and cash slowing down from customers? So Stephanie, that was addressed to you. Yeah, make sure I'm not on mute. Uh, so first of all, Richard Hemington is an international guest from the UK. Oh, wow. So I wish I could see him. So super excited about that. Uh, listen, when you have a peak and you've built up inventory, I would segregate the inventory to high quality inventory that you're just going to sit on and sell, you know, sell over the course of two years versus the inventory that might be more liable. Um, with bicycles, it's a, it's a little different because they tend to release new models every year, kind of like the automotive. Uh, so, um, and then in terms of accounts receivable where you might have sold a lot into your bike stores and they owe you a lot, uh, I would just from a credit perspective, um, really evaluate any retailers where, you, where they may not be able to pay you uh, and there, there could be actual AR risk. Um, but Mr. Richard, I can talk to you directly and we can talk a lot more about it. Um, good, good, to, good to have you on the, 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 the call today. So what we're gonna do now is wrap up. Those were some fun questions from the audience and we really appreciate um, that the attendees took the time today as well as our panelists. And um, from FLG, we hope you can join us for future events, which are part of our leadership series. We're gonna be hosting a fireside chat with author and Stanford Business School lecturer, Carol Robin, on maximizing career success on December 1st. And we hope you will attend that event. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.